When reinforcement learning agents learn to cooperate with other artificial intelligence agents and, more importantly, humans? This is a question that is going to become ever more important in the coming years as applications of artificial intelligence become more widespread. Potential applications include everything from search and rescue missions, seek and destroy, to cornering financial markets, though if the FBI and SEC are listening, I'm definitely kidding on that last point. In today's paper and coding tutorial, we're going to go over the multi-agent deep deterministic policy gradients algorithm. I'm going to go ahead and give you the spoiler and punchline up front. The main innovation here is that uh, it is deep deterministic policy gradients where we give the critic the ability to observe the collective observations of all of our agents. So we'll have a adversarial agent as well as two cooperative agents and we're going to feed the observations of all three to our critic as well as each action taken by all three agents. This gives each critic a sort of global perspective on what is going on. Far from being a way of cheating we're only going to limit the individual actor networks to their own observations so the actors don't get any information about what anybody else is doing they only get their own perspective and have to act accordingly. We're going to test this algorithm in the multi-agent particle environment, which was a special environment coded up by the OpenAI team to test just such an algorithm. The basic idea is that we're going to have two agents that are cooperating to conceal two different landmarks from one adversarial agent. The adversarial agent, in contrast, must reach the green landmark, though it only knows there are two landmarks and it has to reach one of them, it doesn't know which one. The optimal strategy in this situation is for both of the agents to cover both landmarks so that no matter which way the adversary goes, it can't get to the target landmark. Now I must confess that this uh, variant of DDPG suffers from some of the same drawbacks that DDPG itself suffers from, which is to say it does overtrain slightly. You do get sometimes aberrant behavior and it is very brittle with respect to hyperparameter tuning. Nonetheless, this concept of centralized training with decentralized execution is quite promising for the field of multi-agent artificial intelligence. It's a really elegant solution and it's easy to see how we could bolt this solution on to pretty much any algorithm in the actor critic domain. All of that aside, let's go ahead and get into our analysis of the paper and then our coding tutorial. So let's start by checking out the abstract. So here they're going to tell us that Q-learning has problems due to the fact that the environment becomes non-stationary when we introduce multiple agents and that policy gradient methods have to contend with increasing variance as the number of agents grow. So they're going to prove this later on in the paper. It's not something they're just asserting without any real uh, backup. They're going to prove it later on and I'll show you when we get there. Uh, and of course, they're going to have a solution, and it's in the form of multi-agent actor-critic approach, where the agent takes into account the actions of other agents and can even learn something about the policies guiding those agents' choices. So they've clearly set up the motivation for their work here. Uh, the most successful approaches to single-agent reinforcement learning don't really work when applied to the multi-agent case. In the introduction, they give some examples of where multi-agent reinforcement learning uh, could be useful. Fields like robotics, where the control of multiple robots can be important for many applications, as well as the development of language are all cited as potential applications. Now, when you read papers, they're all going to start out with grandiose claims of being the greatest thing since sliced bread. So you should always take these with a little bit of a grain of salt, though obviously this does move the field in the direction of cooperation among agents. And so it's not like it's a totally off the wall claim that isn't supported by the results. It's just a bit of a stretch to say that this particular algorithm is going to find its way into industrial applications. So in the next paragraph, they get to the source of the issue uh, with the single agent approaches. So for Q-learning, all agents' policies naturally evolve over time because we're decaying our epsilon. It uses epsilon greedy action selection and epsilon decays over time. So the policy is changing in time. And that means that when one agent takes an action that causes the agent to transition from one state to another, the other agents are baffled because they didn't take the agent. They didn't take the action. The environment just transitioned from one state to another with no apparent cause as far as they can observe. Uh, this is made worse when you consider the use of replay memory since each of the resulting states may or may not come about from the agent's own actions. So it's just a big heap of problems. And so Q-learning definitely falls flat. And we'll see that in the results where you can actually get something approximating decent results with Q-learning, uh, but it's nowhere near what would be considered uh, on par with MADDPG. 
Now you might think policy gradient methods would be a little bit better, but this actually isn't the case. In the case of policy gradient methods, we can get overfitting to the training data and poor performance during evaluation when using multiple agents. Now they kind of make this observation here and they'll give a little bit more backup for this later on in the paper and we'll cover that when the time comes. They note in the next paragraph or in the next little bit that there are some workaround solutions to this, but the requirements for those are pretty stringent. So the environment dynamics have to be differentiable, meaning that our state transition probabilities can't have any discontinuities in them. So for a deterministic environment, if you take action A in state S1, cause, causing the environment to transition from state S1 to S2, then this should always be the case. The environment can't suddenly decide that instead of going uh, to state 2, it's going to transition into state S3, because then there is a discontinuity in the probability distribution at that point in time, and you can no longer get a derivative. They also mention that there are some assumptions about the interactions among agents, though they don't give too many details here. Perhaps it's outlined in reference 11, which is a paper on generative adversarial networks, but honestly, I'm too lazy to go deep dive and do yet another paper right now. So they go on to say that their proposal has a few, a few important facets. So first, the learned policies only use local information during testing. This means that none of the agents have any input from any of the others, so there's no possibility of direct conspiracy. No conspiracy theories here. The cooperative behaviors we're going to see are strictly emergent phenomenon, meaning they just come about naturally as a result of the fact that the agents have overlapping objectives um, and that the critic function does have a little bit of insight into what drives the other agents. Second, they're not going to assume the environment dynamics are differentiable, so that makes it a much more robust algorithm, at least in the theoretical sense. Finally, it works not just with cooperative environments, but competitive ones as well. And indeed, the one we're going to implement, or the one we're going to use for this particular tutorial, the uh, physical deception environment, is a combination of cooperation and competition, where you have two agents competing to hide a landmark, excuse me, two agents cooperating to hide a landmark from an adversarial agent. So we'll have three different algorithms, three different agents, all with um, competing objectives. So two, two that are cooperating and one that is competing. So it does work in both cases of both cooperation and competition. So their framework boils down to giving the critic information about the policies of all the agents, meaning the actions that those agents took, as well as the observations they used to arrive at the decision to take those actions, while making sure the actor only has limited information. So our actor networks are going to be totally distinct and that you don't have access to the observations of our other agents. So once the training phase is complete, uh, only the actors are used for evaluation. So there really isn't any cheating going on. What's really cool about lighting the critic has some extra information about all the actors is that it can actually learn to approximate the policies of all of the agents. It's not something we're going to implement today because it's kind of overkill for such a simple environment, but this can be really useful in complex competitive environments. Finally, they have a way of learning ensembles of policies which can improve the stability of the agent. And we won't implement that either, but I'll talk a little bit about it when we get to that section of the paper. So as far as the related work section goes, I only want to touch on this paragraph about a concurrent work. So apparently there's another approach to multi-agent RL out there that was uh, used on StarCraft, a game very near and dear to my heart. I spent a fair amount of hours in my youth playing that. Uh, it's a bit different in that it learns a centralized critic for all the agents rather than a uh, centralized critic for each agent. Uh, it also doesn't allow for communication among agents, and it works with recurrent neural networks and discrete policies, whereas MADDPG uses regular deep networks, deep neural networks, and continuous policies. If that's something you'd like to see in a future video, if you'd be interested in seeing me implement it, please leave a comment down below, uh, because that's a whole boatload of work I probably won't undertake unless there's a demand for it. So leave a comment down below if you want to see it, and I'll see what I can do. So like most papers, they go into a lot of background information, just enough to give you a flavor for what reinforcement learning is all about. If you're new to the topic, then this will be very useful for you. If you're a veteran, then it's probably all review. And it's all the usual stuff that we encounter pretty much in every paper. So we're going to be using the Markov decision process framework, where you have sets of states, actions, and rewards that form a trajectory through the game. One slight departure from what we're normally used to here is the fact that we're going to be keeping track of the full state of the system as well as the observations of each of our n agents. So the difference being that each agent has its own perspective and isn't aware of the perspective of other agents, while the state of the system is the collection of all agents' observations. So in the case of the physical deception environment, it's going to be a three-tuple of three different NumPy arrays that comprise the observations of the two 
to cooperative and single competing agent. Uh, each agent has a policy that maps observations to actions, and the agent receives a reward in the process. The agent's goal is to maximize its total expected return, which is just a sum of discounted future rewards over some finite time horizon. Very important. If you're taking an infinite horizon, then what does it mean to maximize an infinite number? I don't know. So if you're new to reinforcement learning, this is pretty much the whole idea of the topic in a nutshell. How can the agent evolve its policy such that it chooses actions that are most likely to lead to the highest possible future rewards over time? Now, there are a number of different algorithms for this, and one in which you are probably familiar of is deep Q learning, uh, which they talk about next. So this is really popular. Um, the basic idea here is that the agent keeps track of something called the action value function denoted by Q as in Q learning. So Q is, is a function of both states and actions, and it's the agent's estimate of the expected future returns for the agent, assuming it takes action A in state S and follows its policy thereafter. So it stands to reason uh, that there's an optimal value for Q such that the expected future returns are as high as possible for all states. That means getting the highest possible score that you can. We call it Q star, and it's what our deep neural network sets out to approximate because neural networks are universal function approximators, and this function Q star is a mathematical function. But in reality, uh, it's a little bit more complicated because we're going to have to have two deep neural networks. So an online network that is updated every time step and is used to determine what action to take, and a target network that is a periodic copy of the online network. So by periodic, I mean that every 100 or 1,000 time steps, we're going to take the parameters of the online network's deep neural network parameters and just copy them directly over to the target network. So the reason we need the target network is because if you only use a single network, uh, then you're uh, using one network to select actions as well as to evaluate their value and you're updating it every time step, you end up chasing a moving target. The agent kind of chases its own tail. And I did a video on this where I show you what happens, and in particular I covered in my course what happens if you try to um, just use a naive implementation of Q-learning with deep neural networks. You end up getting really sharp peaks and then precipitous falls in the agent's reward over time uh, because it's really chasing that moving target. It's not very robust. So the agent learns by performing stochastic gradient descent on the uh, parameters of the online network. So it has some replay buffer that keeps track of the states the agent saw, the actions it took, the rewards it received along the way, and the new states it resulted as a consequence of those actions. This is important because the agent doesn't start out knowing anything about the environment. It just starts out totally blind, not knowing anything, and so uh, feeding it this information allows it to piece together the relationships between states, actions, new states, and rewards. So it basically learns what's called the environment dynamics over time by interacting with that environment. So the loss function is the mean squared error loss of the difference between the Q star and a target value Y determined by the sum of the reward for the action the agent took and the uh, discounted value of the Q star estimate of the maximal, maximal action for the resulting states according to the target network. So it's an estimate. We're using one estimate to update another. It's bootstrapping itself. Um, keep, keep this form of uh, target, that little Y there, in the back of your mind because you're going to see this all over the place in deep reinforcement learning, and we're going to see it indeed again in this particular algorithm. So one thing they don't explicitly state, because people who have been studying reinforcement learning probably already know, is that the agent uses an epsilon greedy action selection policy. So what this means in plain English is that sometimes it selects an action at random, and sometimes it selects an action according to what it thinks is the most profitable action. And uh, the reason it does this is because it's not really sure if its model of the world, in other words, its observations of the relationships between states, actions, rewards, and new states is accurate. And so uh, the proportion to which it selects the random actions is called epsilon, uh, and, and the proportion of the time it takes the maximal actions is called the greedy. So it's kind of the solution to the explore exploit dilemma. Um, 
that proportion of the time it takes random actions does decay over time, but never goes precisely to zero. You want it to asymptotically approach some small number, something like 0.01. 1% of the time it'll take a random action because it's never quite sure that uh, if it thinks some action is maximal, perhaps there's some better action out there waiting for it. It doesn't really know. It has to account for that possibility. Now, apparently people have tried using Q-learning for multi-agent reinforcement learning, but it doesn't really work out. The reason is somewhat technical, but it boils down to the fact that it looks like the environment dynamics are changing over time in a way that none of the individual agents can predict. Uh, if the rules of the game keep changing seemingly at random, it kind of becomes impossible to plot an effective course of action. You might think that uh, Q-learning is the only game in town, but that isn't exactly the case. So. Uh, it turns out there's a whole different way of approaching the reinforcement learning problem, and that is rather than approximating the optimal action value function, you can approximate the agent's policy directly. Uh, again, this is done with a deep neural network because they are universal function approximators, and that network we call the actor because it tells the agent how to act. Quite clever, right? And we can do this because the policy is actually a probability distribution. It's just a function that says, given some state, what is the probability of selecting each action? Uh, in practice, you can use normal distributions. You can use uniform distributions. You use any type of distribution. Uh, you can even use uh, the softmax function to calculate what action to take. But it's just a probability distribution. That's the basic idea. And you, and you approximate it with a deep neural network. So the idea here is that we try to adjust the parameters of the neural network to maximize the probability that the agent selects the most profitable action for each state. Now this is done using gradient ascent on the parameters of our actor network using a loss that's proportional to the product of the log of the policy and the Q function. Now there are multiple ways of estimating the Q function. So in particular, if you use the sampled returns from the agent's interactions with the environment, then this is an algorithm called reinforced. It's a type of Monte Carlo learning. It's pretty popular, even though it is kind of a somewhat older algorithm. Now alternatively, the fancier approach is to use a deep neural network to approximate Q. So you're kind of getting the best of policy gradients as well as Q learning. And in this case, we call that the critic because it criticizes the values, uh, the actions the agent took given some state. And this approach to policy gradient reinforcement learning is broadly called actor critic methods. Now, something I want to note here is that you got the log of this policy pi. So if you're familiar with the logarithmic function, I presume you are, you know that it diverges at zero. Now, this kind of looks problematic on the surface, given that our policy is a probability distribution and probabilities by definition include zero, right? Now, in practice, we use something like a softmax activation function for the output of our agent to ensure nothing goes to zero in the case of discrete actions or normal distributions that have non-zero asymptotic tails in the case of continuous action spaces. So this doesn't actually become a problem in practice. So don't worry about it. It's not something that's going to give you nans in your training. Now, one of the downsides of policy gradient methods is that in general, they suffer from a high degree of variance. So one reason for this is the reward attribution problem. So what's going on is the agent is taking a sequence of actions and gets some total reward. And it's really hard to say uh, which action in that sequence of, re of actions was, was most important in getting that reward. So was it three or four actions ago? Was it the first action you took in the episode that led to the final reward being so large? It's really hard to say. And that leads to a high degree of variance in the agent's learning because it doesn't know which action to assign the most weight to given some state uh, to produce the maximum result in the end. So this is made all the worse in the case of multiple agents, as you might imagine. So here we only use the agent's own actions to update its policy, but the rewards it receives depend on the actions of other agents as well, since they're causing the environment to transition from one state to another as well. So this really amplifies the attribution problem, and the result is just poor learning all around. Nobody gets anything done. Typical, right? Now, they actually proved this mathematically in Proposition 1. It's kind of a neat proof if you want to read through it. I'm not going to bother. I'm just going to give you the punchline here for the sake of brevity. So the idea is that we're dealing with a system that has two actions and a reward of one point. Uh, the agents are initialized with a random policy, so they have a 50-50 chance of selecting each action. So if we have n agents, 
the probability of taking a step in the right direction, meaning the probability that both the agent's estimate of the gradient and the actual true gradient both have the same sign, goes as 0.5 to the nth power, where again, n is the number of agents. So as we add more and more agents, the probability of updating our estimate of the gradient in the correct direction drops exponentially. It's a pretty cool little proof. Uh, it's just a kind of nice little mathematical way of saying that as you grow the number of agents, the probability of doing things correctly decreases exponentially rather than linearly or you know any other type of dependence. Now, all of our discussion about policy gradient methods so far has centered on um, probability distributions. Now, this isn't the only game in town, and in, particularly, and in particular, you can use deterministic policies. So in this case, they call the al algorithm deep deterministic policy gradients. And in that case, the uh, loss function is given by the product of the gradient of the policy with respect to its parameters and the gradient of the critic function with respect to the action taken. Now in practice, we won't implement this form for our cost because spoiler alert, it's MAD DPG and it's based on DDPG. So we're gonna use a similar loss function, but we won't use this form. So this form is actually an application of the chain rule to the gradient of the critic with respect to the parameters of our actor network. So if you remember that if you have a function of the form F of G of X and you want the derivative of F with respect to X, even though f isn't explicitly a function of x, what are you going to do, right? So then you have to use the chain rule. So basically, you take df dg, multiply it by dg dx. So the dgs kind of cancel each other out, in essence, giving you your derivative. So this is the same thing for our ddpg loss. Here we have the gradient of q with respect to the parameters theta, where q is a function of a, which is itself a function of theta. So this is the general form we're going to use because we just get the action from our actor network and use that as input to our critic network to get our loss function. And the loss function is just then proportional to the output of the critic network. It's just a couple of lines as opposed to taking two different gradients. It's just a much easier way uh, than taking the product of two gradients. I mean, you're still taking the product of two gradients, but you let the framework do the heavy lifting for you, right? It's, it's why they're there. So DDPG, again, makes use of target networks and replay buffers, just like Q-learning. Uh, it's kind of like the result of applying those innovations from deep Q-learning to policy gradient methods, uh, and in particular, actor critic methods. So if you aren't familiar with DDPG, it's probably a good idea to get up to speed uh, by checking out my advanced uh, policy gradient methods playlist, where I have at least, I think, one or two videos on the topic. I do go through the paper uh, for the DDPG algorithm in that playlist. Uh, as well as giving a lecture with some slides to give you just the salient points. So it's worth checking out. Uh, you can either pause here and go to that video or watch all the way through here and then come back and watch the other video and, you know, whatever. You do what you think is best. You do you. Uh, so a couple things I'll say is that the target network updates for DDPG are a little bit different than in the case of Q-learning. So in Q-learning, uh, we're doing a hard copy of the online network weights over to the target network every 100 or 1,000 time steps or so. So we're just taking the exact parameters and copying them over to the target network. Uh, instead of doing that for DDPG, we're going to do a weighted moving average every single time step. So it introduces an additional hyperparameter called tau. Uh, it's just an exponential moving average. It's nothing really difficult. It's just a different way of doing things. Another thing to point out here that they don't mention is that our policy is deterministic and as the name suggests. So this means that the agent can't deal with the explore exploit dilemma. So it's constantly outputting deterministic values. How does it know those deterministic values are worth anything, right? Uh, in fact, those deterministic values come from a random initialization of your deep neural network. And so uh, in general, they're probably not going to be so great. Um, to deal with this, so the authors introduce some noise function like a Gaussian normal distribution. So at every time step, you output a, output a deterministic action from your actor network and then you add on some exploratory noise. Now you wanna keep the noise small uh, so that you're not taking wildly different steps than what your network tells you to do, but it should be sufficiently large that you do get some measure of exploration uh, to flesh out your agent's understanding of the environmental dynamics. So finally, with all the background information out of the way, the authors move on to their particular innovation. So uh, they're first gonna impose some constraints on their solution. They're gonna say, 
uh, that when they're evaluating agents, they're only going to use local information. So no cheating here. You're not going to be uh, testing the agents, giving them the information about what the other agents are doing. They also don't want to assume anything about the dynamics of the environment so that it's not brittle with respect to changes in the dynamics of the environment. And they also don't assume anything about the way the agents communicate. It's worth noting they made a bunch of environments here that explicitly deal with communication. And that's actually pretty cool. Uh, if you take a look at the repo, which we'll do later in the video, uh, they have some to deal with cryptography, um, and of course, communication is central to the problem of language uh, evolution. So it's a really cool um, application of the topic and perhaps something I'll explore more in depth later on. Uh, but for now, we're just going to not worry about the communication aspect. So their secret sauce here is that they're going to use centralized training with decentralized execution. So um, that's really shown up here in this uh, figure one. Uh, the critics are going to explicitly use information from all of your agents. So you can see that the observations and actions from each agent are fed into each critic. That's denoted by the arrows leading of those little capsules leading to the squares in green there. Whereas at uh, execution time, uh, the policy is only going to take input from the observation of a particular agent and output its own action. So uh, this is a kind of decentralized, centralized version of reinforcement learning. It's pretty cool, and it's really the main departure from DDPG. Otherwise, it's pretty much the same. Um, so mathematically, uh, we're going to be taking the gradient of this loss function J for each agent. Uh, so we take the gradient with respect to those parameters of the product of the log of the probability pi and the Q value. Note that the Q gets the input X, which is a vector collection of all the observations, as well as the actions of each agent. Now, if we use uh, deterministic policies, then we replace the above gradient expression by this one here, which is just, again, the chain rule applied to the gradient of Q with respect to the parameters of the actor network theta. So it's it's basically the exact same loss function from DDPG, but the critic gets the observations of all the agents as well as their actions as input. Uh, we'll again be sampling relevant data from the replay buffer, but instead of just sampling single observations, we're gonna be sampling this vector X that contains all of the observations as well as the set of all actions taken by the agents at each time step. Now, uh, the great thing about including the uh, actions of all of the agents is that it takes a kind of intractable problem uh, and makes it tractable. So instead of the environment being non-stationary, really it's stationary. So that's because the state transition probabilities only depend on the starting states and the actions taken, both of which are known. The underlying policies that generate those actions don't really affect the environment. They are whatever they are. They could be totally random. They could be deterministic. They could be whatever. It could be the agent pressing a single button over and over and over again. It doesn't really matter. Um, if we weren't conditioning the agents uh, on the actions, if we weren't conditioning the critic on, on the actions of other agents, then the state transition probabilities would depend on something we can't observe about our environment. So in these uh, next couple of sections, they talk about uh, in stuff like inferring the policies of other agents as well as acting with on, uh, ensembles of policies. And in particular, that policy ensemble idea is pretty cool. The basic idea is that as you train, the agent can overfit to its competitor's strategy. So it learns to beat just that competitor. And naturally, these policies evolve over time. So when that competitor's policy changes, uh, your heroic agent is kind of screwed because it doesn't know what to do. Now you can train with ensembles of policies where you have say 5, 10, whatever number of policies and each one of those can learn to accommodate a different type of policy for its competing agent. It's a pretty cool concept. We're not going to implement it here. If you are a completionist, I'll go ahead and leave that up to you as an exercise to the reader. So we'll cover the algorithm right before the coding section. Uh, so let's go ahead and check out the experiments they do. So next, they detail the environments they created to test their algorithm. They do have their own package, which we'll have to do a uh, download from the GitHub and do a, a pip install on. I'll show you how to do that in the coding section. We'll have to create a virtual environment because it has some rather old uh, dependencies. So you don't want to cloud up your, you don't want to muck up your base 
uh, install Python. So we'll have to make a virtual environment and use their own set of environments. So we're going to focus on one of those environments, and that is depicted in the rightmost panel here, and that is a task of physical deception. So the basic idea is that you have two agents that are cooperating with each other to hide these two landmarks. So one landmark here, it's denoted in red, is the target landmark, and the adversary is attempting to reach that target landmark. Landmark. Now it knows that there are two landmarks. It doesn't know which one is the target. It just knows it has to reach one of them. It doesn't know which one is which. And the uh, optimal solution here is for both agents to go ahead and cover up both of those landmarks so that way no matter which one the adversary goes to, uh, it's not going to hit it, right? They, the agents can't, the agent and the adversary can't um, exist in the same space, right? There's a, a poly exclusion principle at play here. Uh, so this is the base environment we're going to be using and it's it's pretty simple but it's actually really cool because it has both cooperation and competition built in. So the two uh, cooperating agents obviously has to have to cooperate to prevent the adversary from reaching the target landmark, and the adversary is competing with those two. So it contains both cooperative and competitive agent uh, elements, and so I think it's a pretty cool environment. So we'll have some uh, options here. Now if you take a look at figure three, you can see these bar charts of relative scores for different algorithms for the two cooperating and competing agent. So the one in red is the case of physical deception for two agents, which is what we're gonna be doing. So on the far left here, you see MADDPG versus MADDPG. So meaning that both of the uh, uh, cooperating agents get trained with MADDPG, as well as the competing agent gets trained with MADDPG. And you see that it gets a relative score, something like 0 0.7, a normalized score of 0 0.7. And then you compare that to MAD DPG versus DDPG, uh, meaning that the two cooperative agents get the upgraded super sauce MAD DPG, and the uh, adversary gets the peasant class DDPG algorithm. And you see that the relative score then is significantly higher. So it does outperform DDPG uh, in mixed environments. Then in the third uh, little chunk of bar plots there, you have DDPG versus MADDPG, where the adversary just totally trounces all over the two agents because they don't really cooperate at all. Uh, so that does establish the supremacy of MADDPG. And then actually, interestingly, if you do DDPG versus itself, you do get slightly better behavior in the physical deception environment for n equals 2, but not n equals 4, which is uh, represented by the orange bar. Kind of interesting. I haven't tested that myself. Uh, I do get results consistent with what they get with their algorithm because you can, uh, with their own code, because you can download and execute their code, which is written in like TensorFlow 1. Point something. So again, I recommend making a um, virtual environment for that as well if you want to do that. Um, but th these results are consistent with what I'm going to show you and what we're going to do together uh, in this particular video. So then if we scroll down <clears throat> to figure four, we see what is a typical learning curve for this algorithm. So uh, the MAD DPG uh, plot is in the purplish color and it's on the top indicating it does the best. And the interesting thing here is that it achieves a plateau after about 5,000 episodes. Uh, so that's pretty cool that it learns relatively quickly. You don't have to let this run very long to know that it's actually learning. That's really cool. And interestingly, all of the other algorithms kind of seem like they do the same thing with the exception of TRPO, which is in orange. Uh, and that looks to my eye like it's trending up over time. I wonder if TRPO or perhaps it's more robust variant PPO would actually uh, intersect the MAD DPG curve if they let it run for say 50,000 games. So I wonder if they did a little bit of cherry picking here. It's entirely possible. Uh, there's a little bit more cherry picking I'll get into here in a second, but this is the type of results we should expect. And you'll observe this uh, when we code it up ourselves. And this is for a different environment, uh, but you see the same uh, type of behavior with uh, the adversarial environment we're going to implement as well. Uh, they do give us the first hint of our implementation details here. Uh, the idea is that we're going to have a pretty simple deep neural network, uh, two hidden layers, uh, a two-layer unit, sorry, a two-layer deep neural network with 64 units per layer and value activations. Of course, the outputs are unactivated for the critic. Uh, so pretty straightforward there, and they give more details in a moment. 
Now, if you take a look at figure five, here we have a few panels showing actual gameplay uh, from the agents. Now, I must confess, here I believe they're doing a little bit of cherry picking. Uh, they are not misrepresenting, they're just showing you the best possible cases. So on the left bottom three panels, you have three different time steps of MAD, DPG, and the physical deception environment. On the left is time T equals zero, where you have the two cooperating agents in bluish starting out at random locations along with the red adversary. And the two landmarks are the smaller black and green dot. So the adversary has to reach the green dot. It does, but again, it doesn't know which is which. It doesn't know which one is black and which one is green. It just knows there's two of them and it has to get there. And in the middle time panel, the middle panel is like time step T equals five, I think. So five steps into the episode. And the rightmost is 25 steps into the episode. And uh, you can see in the rightmost one for MAD DPG, you have both of the cooperating agents um, almost converging on the two landmarks. Uh, they're there to prevent the adversary from approaching those two particular landmarks. So this is best case scenario. This is a clear example of cooperation and it's something I do see in my own training. Now, if you take a look at the uh, rightmost three panels on the bottom there, you see the results of training DDPG for all of the agents. And you can see they st again start out at random positions. And then by five time steps in, one of the agents has taken off into La La Land. It's went off to find itself on a Tibetan mountain or something, I don't know. Uh, but it's gone, gone with the wind. And uh, it leaves the other ones to do all the heavy lifting. If that isn't a metaphor for college, I don't know what is uh, with all those group projects. Uh, but also I do see this behavior even with MAD DPG. Now, I don't think there's a bug in my code. Uh, perhaps you can find it if there is. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward algorithm once you see it coded up, so there isn't a whole lot of room for mistakes. Although now that I say that, perhaps I'll find it on the fly when I'm coding it. Uh, but I do see both sets of behavior uh, with respect to MAD DPG. And uh, so I think they do a little bit of cherry picking here. Uh, and that wouldn't be anything, you know, that wouldn't be anything particularly out of the ordinary, you always want to show the best results in your paper, right? You don't want to show the worst results. That wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. That's not good marketing and doesn't really depict the full power of the algorithm. They're not saying it's a perfect 100% of the time. They're just saying, hey, look, uh, in general, it learns uh, to deal with cooperative and competitive environments. Another thing to note is that DDPG itself is highly sensitive to hyperparameter tuning. And so it stands to reason that MAD DPG is sensitive as well. Probably even more so if I'm being honest since they have so much more complexity, right? Because the input vectors to your critic are significantly larger. It has a much larger parameter space to crawl over. So uh, it suffers from a little bit of brittleness. I didn't do a whole lot of experimentation with hyperparameters. Uh, and I didn't get much better performance than they did. If I evaluate their code, uh, if I run their code, uh, specifically from GitHub uh, and compare their scores to my scores, it's pretty much the same. So I think I'm doing the right stuff. So that's all I wanted to cover from the paper since I've rambled enough. So let's talk a little bit about implementation details. Um, so some of the stuff they left out from the paper is that each agent is gonna have four distinct deep neural networks. One for the actor, one for the critic, one target actor, and one target critic network. So we'll only perform gradient ascent on the actor and gradient descent on the critic networks and then do soft updates on the target networks uh, at each time step or each time we perform a learning update that is. So we're going to have a single replay buffer for all of our agents and that's going to store all the observations of each agent at each time step as well as the rewards, uh, actions taken and new states. So we have to make sure that when we feed in the observations uh, to the agents for the updates to the deep neural network. They were feeding the correct observations to the correct agents. You don't want to mix and match. That would be bad, right? Uh, the critic gets input from all the agents, so that will be pretty easy. Uh, we'll just have a utility function to handle the kind of a nuance in the way the observations are returned from our environment. Uh, the replay, buff replay buffer class will also have functionality to store new memories as well as to sample the buffer to get a uniform random sampling of memories. Now the way I'm going to handle this is going to be a little different than how I would normally do 
because of the fact that we uh, need to keep the observations for each actor straight. So the actor will get a series of lists to keep track of their own individual observations, uh, while we use a single matrix to keep track of the total set of observations for input to the critic. If this sounds confusing, don't worry. It'll make a little bit more sense when you see it in code. In addition to the classes for the replay buffer, the actor network and the critic network, we'll need a class for a generic agent and then a sort of container class to hold all of our agents. So the agent will have functionality to choose actions, update the network parameters of the target networks, and to load and save model checkpoints. The container class, which I'm just going to call MADDPG, will hold a list of all the agents and have interface functions for saving and loading models for all the agents. It's also going to have an interface function for choosing actions for each agent since our environment is going to expect a list of NumPy arrays as input to the step function. The learn function itself is also going to be part of the MADDPG class, and this is where most of our complexity will lie. So we'll need to get actions according to the current target actor network for input in our cost function. So we're going to have to iterate over all of our agents once to get those and then iterate over the agents again to perform the updates to their deep neural network. So there's going to have two loops in there. It's a little complicated, but it's not too bad. Uh, finally, we'll need a global utility function to convert the list of observation vectors from the environment into a single flattened observation vector for saving in the replay buffer. So the algorithm is about what you would expect based on what we've read. So you're going to play a bunch of episodes and get the initial state X. Now remember that initial state X is the uh, collection of observations for all of your agents. So for each step of the episode, do the following. For each agent, select an action according to the deterministic output of the neural network and noise distribution. Execute that set of actions and get the reward and new state X prime. Store the X prime, actions reward, and X in the replay buffer, and then set the current state X to the new state X prime. So for each agent, do the following. Sample a random mini batch of memories from the replay buffer. Set the target to be the sum of the reward and the discounted output of the target credit network where the actions are chosen according to the target actor networks. Update the critic by minimizing the mean squared error loss of the delta between the target and the output of the regular critic network with actions sampled from the replay buffer. Update the actor using the mean of the output of the critic network with the actions chosen according to the output of the actor network. Note that here I'm using the gradient before the application of the chain rule just to make our lives easier. And this is actually gradient ascent, and so we're going to have to have a negative sign in here. After updating all of your online networks, perform the soft updates to the target networks. Now down here in the experimental results, they give us some of their hyperparameters. So we'll use the atom optimizer with a learning rate of 0.01, kind of a large learning rate, and a tau of 0.01, also a little bit large for your soft network updates. They set, to gamma, they set their gamma to 0.95, though I think I might have used 0.99 in my code. Not a huge difference um, when we get there off my cheat sheet. I'll see which I use. I don't really remember. They use a batch size of 1,024 transitions, so a large batch size for input to their neural network. And they only perform updates once they've filled up those 1,024 transitions, so we're going to need a way to make sure that we don't... Uh, try to update our deep neural networks before we take those 1,024 time steps. Now, the other thing to note is that they're not doing an update at every time step like you would do in most temporal difference learning methods. The updates are only performed every 100 time steps. Uh, so the learning burden, the uh, burden on your GPU that is, it's gonna be a little bit lower this hour. The actually executes pretty quickly. We'll know within a few minutes if our agent is learning. So that's a pretty nice feature of it. All right, so that is really it for all our implementation details and the theory behind it. Let's go ahead and get started coding this. Okay, so the first thing we are going to need to do is get the multi-agent particle environment or MAPE from GitHub. So this is the OpenAI page for that environment. And the thing to note is that it has some rather uh, outdated dependencies. So this will be a situation where we definitely want to use a Python virtual environment to handle uh, segregating out these archaic dependencies from the more modern ones you probably have already installed on your system. So 
we can get away with whatever most recent version of Python 3 you're running. I think I'm on Python 3.7 and it works just fine. So this, we don't really need to worry about, I don't think. If you run into issues with this, you shouldn't because it doesn't rely on any um, like esoteric Python features. So I don't think that should be a problem, but you will certainly need uh, OpenAI Gym and NumPy to be the correct versions. This OpenAI Gym in particular, it won't run with the newest versions. So we're gonna have to install these in a virtual environment after we go ahead and copy out this code. So uh, what we will do is we will do a git clone, uh, we will make our virtual environment, install our dependencies, and then do the pip install dash e dot to get the installation of this particular environment. And then we'll go ahead and start coding up our, our agents. Okay, so I've already copied out the URL. So we just do a git clone of that and we can go ahead and cd into that and then do python dash m bnv i don't know m80 vg something like that and that should create our virtual environment source bin activate oh obviously we want to do source <laughs> Uh, MADTBG bin activate. So now we are in our virtual environment, do a pip list, and that is empty as you would expect. So let's go ahead and do pip install gym equals, let me go ahead and look at the version up here. That was 0 0.1, 0 0.5. And so that looks like it got NumPy for me as well. Pip list. So it looks like I have uh, NumPy 1.20. So we need to do pip install um, NumPy. Pip install NumPy equals 114.5. Hopefully I didn't just break anything. Pip list, we still have Jim, we have the correct version of NumPy, we have a suitable version of Python. So now we should be able to do pip install dash e dot and see if that works and it did. So now we can do pip install torch and that'll take a second. I'm gonna go ahead and pause the video here. Okay, so that went ahead and finished. And so what the first thing I want to do is is go ahead and make a test script so that we can get a feel for how this type of environment, how these new environments work. So we're going to go ahead and check out uh, some of the basic features. So we're going to say import numpy as np from make env import make env. This make env function is going to be our uh, gym, the equivalent of gym.make. So we say env equals make environment simple adversary. That is the one we will be using for this project. Then uh, we want to say how many agents we have. Number of agents env.n is the variable for that. Print observation space env observation space zero dot shape and we want to know what is our action space env dot action space and print number of actions env dot action space zero dot n so there the indexing has to do with the agent i believe which agent we want um, and so then what we want to do next is let's say what does an observation from our environment look like so observation equals env.reset and then let's just print that observation to the terminal so let's right quit out of that so now we have that let's go ahead and run it and see what we get and so you can't quite see it through my mug actually let me move my face here for a second uh, what we see is that we have three agents. So we have the two cooperative agents and the one competing. Our observation space for one of them, it looks like, uh, so for the first agent is a vector of eight. You know what, I don't, let's do this. I wanna do just 
let's try this. Um, so this will be for the zeroth agent, and then there is also um, what's the easiest way to do that? What is this going to give me? Let's try it again. Yeah, list attribute has no list object has no attribute shape, so it's a list. Let's just do this. Sorry, it's been a while since I've run this. Uh, okay, so now this is a little bit more clear. So what we see is that we have three agents. Our observation space is going to be a list of three vectors. The first vector will have eight elements. The second vector will have 10, and the third vector will have 10. So this one with eight elements is going to be our adversary, and these two with 10 are going to be our two cooperative agents. Of note is that we have a discrete action space. Now this would seem to be problematic on the surface because uh, DDPG works with continuous actions and the fact they even say it in the paper. So this might be a bit of an issue. We're gonna have to work around that and I'll show you how in one second, um, or rather as the video progresses. But it's important to note we have five actions. So I've already played around with it and what the five actions correspond to is Action zero is do nothing, and then one, two, three, and four correspond to like move up, down, left, and right, something like that. So then if we print our uh, observation, you can see that indeed you do get a list of NumPy arrays with eight, 10, and 10 elements, and that's denoted here by this big mess of numbers. Okay, so we kind of know what we're working with here. We have a bit of an issue we're gonna have when we get an observation back from the environment, we're going to have a list of NumPy arrays. That's going to be a little bit problematic for our memory. We have to do a little bit of uh, tweaking to our memory class. Um, and you can see that the right away, the action space isn't what we would expect for something with DDPG. Instead, here we're dealing with discrete numbers instead of, um, instead of uh, continuous ones. So let's come back here. And uh, let's comment out this stuff because we don't really need it at this point. What we want to do is say action, you know what, let's just say no op equals np array. So this will be one action, one, zero, 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 zero. And then we'll say action equals no op, no op, no op. Up. So the environment is going to expect a list of NumPy arrays as actions, just like it gives you back a list of NumPy arrays for observations. Fortunately, all of our agents have the same number, have the same action space. That makes life a little bit easier than having variable length actions. That could be a bit of a nuisance. So if we say uh, obs underscore reward done info equals env step action, and then print our reward, uh, then what we will see is we get some number as well. And so let's also do this print um, done. So we'll print both of those things uh, to see what we get. So let's run that again. And so what you see is um, for the reward, you get a tuple of a list, excuse me, of three elements uh, that corresponds to the reward for the adversary and the two agents for taking that no op. And the other interesting thing here is that we get a list of false elements for all three agents. Now, this is another uh, caveat to their environment in that they do not specify a terminal condition for the environment. The agent can actually run off the screen and stay there. If we don't impose some type of constraint on our own, then the episode will never terminate and you won't get any learning. Uh, that took me a few minutes to figure out. It wasn't uh, that hard, but it was a little bit, um, I don't know, shall we say surprising where they don't have a max number of steps built into their environment. So that's something we have to deal with. Uh, so the only, uh, the, the real solution to that is very simple. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying while not done, we'll just say uh, while number of steps within the episode is less than some number like say 25. Uh, so it just requires a little bit of modification to how we would normally do things, but it is something to know about their environment. Now, the other thing to look at here is, okay, so we have uh, a discrete output here, five discrete numbers, five integers. Now, 
That is problematic because deep deterministic policy gradients works with continuous numbers. So what if we change this to something like, say, I don't know, 0 0.1, 1, 2, 3, 3, and whatever, 5, 4, something like that. What if we try that and see what happens? Lo and behold, we still get something that kind of makes sense. So we still get a reward like we would expect and the terminal flags are still false as we would expect. So nothing breaks if we pass in continuous numbers instead of discrete ones. And this is one example of where the OpenAI gym accommodates both uh, continuous and discrete numbers as input. Now I haven't done a really big deep dive under the hood to see what the environment is doing. Uh, when you pass in continuous versus discrete numbers for an environment in which the uh, action space is a box, meaning a discrete number. Uh, sorry, just, just, just discrete, not the box. That applies to the observations, but I don't know how it handles that. Uh, it's something I would invite you to do if you are so inclined. But um, these are just some nuances we have to keep in mind when working with this new set of environments that they don't typically conform to the they don't conform to the typical standards of the OpenAI gym, and there's a few nuances we have to be aware of. So uh, with all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and start coding up our agents. So I am going to go ahead and for this tutorial, I'm gonna dump everything in one file. And when I create a GitHub for this, I'm gonna separate it out into multiple files uh, just for the sake of clarity and ease in the video. So I'll say, maddpg torch.py and so we're going to have a whole bunch of imports here so we will need os for file joining operations when we handle model checkpointing we need numpy for numpy type operations torch uh, torch.nn for our layers uh, and then functional for our activation functions And we will need make environment. And so let's go ahead and start with our replay buffer. Now, I'm going to call this multi-agent replay buffer because there are a number of differences between what I would normally do and this particular class. So we'll need a max size, a million transitions, the number of dimensions for our critic, number of dimensions for our actor, because remember, they can be different. A number of actions, a number of agents, because we have to keep track of the memory for all the agents, as well as a batch size. I have moved that into the memory class, as I should have done a long time ago. Let's go ahead and save our stuff. Let's say mem counter. This will keep track of uh, our memories in some sense. We'll have to do some finagling. Uh, to get everything to work properly, which you will see momentarily. Okay, so we're going to start with our state memory. And you may ask uh, whose state memory? We have, you know, actors and critics and multiple agents. We have a lot of different things to keep track of, a lot of strands in old Duder's head. Uh, so this will be for the critic dimension. So uh, this portion of the class that uses NumPy arrays for memory will focus on the critic. New state memory. And then we're gonna use lists, uh, lists of NumPy arrays to keep track of the actor stuff. Uh, and that is actually the hardest part of this problem. Really, the algorithm itself is pretty straightforward. Uh, the difficulty is in, in accommodating the various different memory sizes and various different agents. That's a little bit tricky. It's not super hard, but it's uh, a lot of strands in old Duder's head for my big Lebowski fans out there. M size and agents type equals bool. Now, something, if you're new to reinforcement learning, the uh, critic value for the terminal state is always zero. The reason is that when the agent reaches the terminal state, the episode terminates and therefore no future rewards follow. A new episode uh, starts and then that is from the start state. It is from the start state that you get an expected future reward. So we have to accommodate the fact that the 
terminal state has no value. Uh, and the easiest way to do that in PyTorch anyway is uh, with using an array of bools to do kind of like a, like a masking operation on our rewards, on our uh, estimates. So now we can handle the initialization of our actor memory. Um, and the reason we want a separate function for this is because uh, we're going to be using lists and uh, the memory counter is a little bit of a nebulous concept when you're working with lists of NumPy arrays. And so you need a separate function to go ahead and zero out the actor's memory when it reaches the maximum memory size for both the actor and the critic. So actor state memory is an empty list. New state actor new state memory equals empty list actor action memory is an empty list i in range and agents actor state memory dot append a numpy array mp zeros the ith actors dims and that gets a whole bunch of <laughs> parentheses actor new state memory sorry I'm my hand is resting on my microphone stand not the best ergo solution actor dims sub i self dot actor action memory Right now we need our function to store a transition in our memory. So we'll say depth store transition. Uh, we will need to pass in a raw observation because we have to pass in the stuff for the critic, which takes the observations of all of our agents. We will need a state, which is going to be the flattened. Um, excuse me, the state will be for the critic because it'll be the flattened combination of all the observations. The raw observation is for the for the actor memory. Like I said, a lot of strands to keep straight in old Duder's head. Uh, we'll need a, a new state raw observation, a new state, and our terminal flag. So if our memory counter modulus mem size equals zero and the memory counter is greater than zero, self init actor memory, that accommodates the fact that when we reach the end of the memory we want to overwrite the earliest memories since we're doing lists for our actor we have to simply zero it out and create a new list uh, a new list of numpy arrays it's just kind of the consequence of how i've decided to de decided to design this so next we need is the position of the first available memory and then we're going to iterate over agents agent idx and range because remember, this is the memory for all of the agents. We say self actor state memory agent idx sub index raw obs agent idx actor new state memory uh, raw obs underscore agent idx actor action memory oh i have a kitty demanding to be let out one second all right so if it's not immediately apparent from the code what this is doing we're iterating over all of our agents and getting the appropriate observations and actions from the lists of numpy arrays that we pass in as input to the store transition function and storing them to the appropriate position in the list for each agent, um, each agent's actor effectively. I know it's a very confusing uh, way of doing things, but really uh, it's the least kludgy solution I could come up with. Um, sorry about that. But now we can handle the critic case. So self state memory index equals state. This is more in line with what you're familiar with. If you've been a uh, frequent viewer of the channel, uh, reward memory index equals reward. Uh, 
done. And then we want to increment our memory counter by one. Next, we have to handle the function to sample our buffer. And that doesn't take any inputs. The first thing we want to know is what is the um, highest position we have filled in our memory because we don't want to sample a bunch of zeros. And that's given by the minimum of memory counter and mem size. Let's get our batch random choice uh, max mem self batch size and replace equals false. Replace equals false just ensures that we don't uh, get the same memory twice. States equals self state memory batch rewards. Now we have to handle the states and actions for our actors. I don't need a self there, sorry. Actor states, new states and actions. So we want to save um, the appropriate uh, memory. Uh, we want to reference the appropriate memory for our agent and then append it to a list that we're going to pass back to the main program. And then we're going to return the actor states. States, remember the difference between these is that the actor states are individual NumPy arrays of length either 8 or 10 or 10. And the states are the flattened combination of all three of those that, that we use to pass into our critic. And the actor states are what we use to pass into each individual actor for each agent. Actions, rewards, uh, actor, new states states underscore and terminal. And finally, I want a simple function to determine whether or not we're allowed to sample a memory based on whether or not we have filled up the batch size of our uh, memories. So we'll just call this function ready. And we'll say if mem counter greater than or equal to batch size, return true. Otherwise, return false. Okay, now all of that was a fair amount of complexity and that is honestly one of the most complex classes in the entire operation here. Next, we're gonna move on to our critic and actor networks. So we'll start with critic network. That'll derive from nn.module. Our initializer takes a learning rate, we'll call it beta. Uh, reason being that the actor and critic can have separate learning rates, although in their implementation as well as mine, we just use the same learning rate for both actor and critic, but it is entirely possible to have separate ones. Number of dims for the first and second, second fully connected layers. And then we'll need a number of agents, number of actions, and a checkpoint directory. Uh, the name will be to accommodate the fact that we're going to have multiple agents, each having two different, four different networks, excuse me, a, uh, an actor, a critic, and a target actor, a target critic. So we have a whole slew of stuff to keep track of. And we want to make sure that when we save our checkpoints, we're saving the correct model to the correct file. And more importantly, when we're loading those models, that we load the correct model from the correct file. So let's call our super constructor. I don't want to forget that. And then we can make our checkpoint file, OS path join, uh, checkpoint directory and name. And then we have our network. So one linear. So that'll be the input dims plus 
number of agents times number of actions. So our, <laughs> uh, this is a kind of a bit of a mess. So you have to accommodate the fact that we have uh, our critic taking in the full state observation vector of the whole system. So all 28 dimensions, eight for the adversary and then 10 and then 10 for each cooperating agent. And then you also have to feed in the number of actions, the full action vectors for each of those agents. So that's why we need input dims, which is the uh, full state vector size, 28 in this case, plus n agents times n actions, or 15. And then, uh, of course, fc1 dims on the other side. And that goes fc1 dims, fc2 dims, and our q is an nn linear, and that takes in fc2 dims and outputs a scalar quantity. We need our optimizer, optim.atom. What are we optimizing? Our parameters of our network. We will need a device. So use a GPU if at all possible, and then send your network to that device. Now we need our feed forward that takes a state and action pair as input. I forgot a colon, there we go. Uh, so we'll just pass these forward. So we'll say self fc1 t.cat state and action along the first dimension. And make sure we get the appropriate number of parentheses. Then we pass that output through the second fully connected layer with a ReLU activation. And then we get Q. Uh, which will just be the final output and that is unactivated and we return it. Next we need a function to save a checkpoint. So torch.save, we want to save the state dictionary to the checkpoint file. And then we need a function to load a checkpoint. And that is self.load state dictionary t.load self.checkpoint. Seems like I should just uh, rename that variable checkpoint file. Okay, that is it for our critic network. So now we do our actor network. Likewise, that derives from nn.module. New learning rate alpha input dims. SC1 dims, FC2 dims, number of actions, a name, and a checkpoint directory. Call our super constructor. And then we say self.checkpoint file OS path join checkpoint directory and name. And then we can go ahead and define our layers. This one is more straightforward, input dims and FC1 dims. We're just gonna be taking the agents, uh, excuse me, each agent's individual portion of the observation vector and passing it in. So either eight, 10 or 10, not the full 28 dimensions. And our Final output will be number of actions. Parameters, LR equals, I believe I called it alpha, correct. Good grief. Who yeah, else, CPU and self.2 device. Now it's worth noting that these networks are so small you could probably get away with running this on a CPU. I haven't tried it. Might be an interesting exercise. So we wanna go ahead and pass um, our state through the first fully connected layer and activate it. Do I have enough? Yep. And then say x equals f dot relu sc2x and then pi equals t dot softmax and 
And so here we're using a soft max activation. Now, it's interesting that I was doing this, now that I'm reading it, uh, I recognize that I did this when I was using probability distributions uh, because I did many different iterations of solutions to this problem because the first time I did it, I thought, well, we're going to need uh, some sort of discrete action to pass out. And so I had one hot encodings uh, selecting the max element from the soft max output. And so um, I'm going to leave that for now. Um, I know it works this way. If you guys want to play around with that output, it might be worthwhile. Um, I think it, I know it still works because the, um, I believe the action space is from zero to one for each of those five elements of our, of our list of our five vector for the action space. So this does work. Uh, you could just as easily use something like a sigmoid here, uh, or a tan, uh, I don't think a tan hyperbolic would work. You want something bounded between zero and one, uh, just as long as it meets that criteria, it should work. So then we have two functions to save and load a checkpoint. I'm just going to copy these here, yank and paste. All right, that is it for our actor class. Pretty straightforward. And as I said in the lecture portion, we're going to have a class for an agent. The agent has an actor and a critic network, but it's not going to have a memory. We're going to have a global memory, uh, and we're going to have each individual agent just dealing with its own neural network type operations. And then we're going to have an MADDPG class on top that holds a list of agents and handles the learning functionality because it's just easiest to arrange it that way in this particular case. <laughs> class agent. So now we have our initializer. That'll take actor dims, critic dims, number of actions, um, an agent IDX because we're going to have multiple agents. So we want to keep track of which agent is which. Uh, checkpoint directory, some default values for our learning rates. Uh, FC1, 64, FC2, 64. Uh, gamma, I do use a default of 0 0.95 and a tau 0 0.01. Let's call our, we don't need a super constructor, excuse me. Gamma, tau, number of actions. And our agent name, we're not going to get creative here. We're going to say agent underscore. So it's just going to be agent underscore one, two, or three, or zero, one, or two, I think, uh, for whichever agent we have. Then we're going to need our actor equals actor network alpha actor dims um, sc1, sc2, and actions checkpoint directory name equals here we want to make sure that we keep track of the fact that we have actors for multiple agents so it's going to be whichever agent this particular agent is so its name plus underscore actor and we'll do the same thing for a critic beta critic dim so c1 sc2 uh, number of actions that needs a number of agents and we need a did I no, I flipped these didn't I and agents and actions let me double check up here so and agents and actions and agents and actions yeah right here okay we definitely don't want to swap those that'll be a problem and agents and actions uh, then we need a checkpoint directory, a name, name plus critic. Okay. And then we will need a target actor and target critic. I'm going to be bold and yank and paste these two here and insert the word target. And that will be underscore target actor and then this is target critic underscore target underscore critic all 
Alrighty. So that is it for our networks. Ah, yeah, that's not right. Equals, whoops, critic network. Yeah, I did it here too, didn't I? Equals critic network, there we go. Good thing I'm paying attention. All right, now we need a function to update our network parameters. Reason being is that when we start out the episode, uh, or start, excuse me, start out the simulation, we want to directly copy the weights of our online networks to our target networks. And so it's easiest just to call it this way. And let's go ahead and write that function first because it's a little bit ugly. And we'll say tau equals none. So if tau is none, then set tau to self.tau. So if we don't pass in something, go ahead and use the default value. If we do pass in something, then use that. So the only time we're gonna pass in something is at the very beginning when we wanna do the hard copy. So we need to go ahead and iterate over a bunch of different stuff. So we'll say target actor params named parameters, we'll say actor params, actor.named parameters, and target actor state dict. If you know a better way of doing this, I feel like I have a better way in some other project that I've forgotten that I have, uh, because this is really, really ugly. Actor state dictionary, uh, then by all means drop a comment. Uh, let me know, hey idiot, you did it better in some other video, why didn't you do it that way? Uh, I'll say, well, a lot of strains in old Duder's head. Uh, her name in, sorry, I guess Big Lebowski is top of mind today for some reason. Actor state dict. Tau times actor state. Some name dot clone plus one minus tau times target actor state dictionary name clone and then we say self dot target actor load state dictionary actor state dict so what this will do is iterate over uh, both of the actor and target actor uh, named parameters, perform the appropriate multiplication with tau and then sum them up and then upload that dictionary to the um, target actor. And now I'm going to be even more bold and do the same, just copy and paste for the critic. Now I might regret this because this probably isn't much easier. Target critic. And I could probably do some fancy copy and replace here. But honestly, my Vim skills are a little weak. It is on my to-do list to become a better Vim user. Target critic state dictionary. Target critic critic. name in critic state dictionary. That won't work. Yeah, there must be a better way of doing this. I'm sure someone will roast me in the comments. But if you're gonna roast me, please provide a link for where I can learn to be better. Target critic load state dictionary Critic state dictionary. And I don't think I messed up famous last words. Uh, okay, now we need a function to choose an action. And that takes an observation as input. Um, so what we wanna do is take our observation and convert it to a tensor and add a batch dimension because that's what PyTorch expects. And we will need 
to um, specify a D type of float, otherwise it'll pass in a double. Make sure to send it to the appropriate device. Go ahead and perform your forward propagation and say noise t.rand self n actions to self actor. Again, it has to be a CUDA tensor. And then our action equals our actions plus noise. And we have to return action detach CPU numpy sub zero because it we can't pass a PyTorch tensor into the environment and expect it to function. We have to actually get out uh, our actual NumPy array and it saves it as, it returns it as a tuple of a NumPy array. So you have to index the zeroth element. Next we have our functionality to save and load models. So def save models, we will say self actor save checkpoint. And then the inverse for the load models function. There we go. Okay. Now that is it for our particular agent class. And now we come to the really, no, not the hardest part of the problem, but the really the heart of the problem. And that is the wrapper class, <laughs> not like DMX, uh, but the class that wraps up all the agents. So we'll say that we want to pass in our actor dims, critic dims, number of agents, number of actions, uh, a scenario and we'll default that to simple uh, because we'll test with a simple environment first to make sure this works some learning rates uh, number of parameters 0 0.9 I don't know why I've used multiple different values here temp maddpg we need to do a make directory on that okay so now we need a list of agents to keep track of our adversary and two cooperating agents number of agents number of actions now we want to go ahead and take into account the fact that we also have scenarios for different environments. So we want to append uh, our um, scenario to our checkpoint directory so that way we keep the different agents trained for different scenarios or environments separate from each other. Now we say for agent IDX in range number of agents. We want to say self.agents.append. So now we actually go ahead and create each agent. Actor dims, agent IDX, um, critic dims, number of actions, agent IDX for our name. second closing parenthesis and so here I'm not passing in a gamma so I am using the default value of 0 0.95 that answers that uh, and that's it for our initializer all we're doing here is creating a list of agents and calling the constructor for each agent it's pretty straightforward this is after all just a wrapper class uh, that handles the fact that we have multiple agents so now we can say save checkpoint And what we want to do is just use a simple print statement, saving checkpoint, and for agent in self.agents, agent.save models. So for each agent you want to save its models, def load checkpoint,
All right, very simple bookkeeping function. Now we need a function to handle choosing an action. So we'll say def choose action. And the reason we have to do it this way is because the, the environment expects a list of uh, actions, a list of NumPy arrays as an action to the step, uh, as input to the step function. Sorry, I can't speak. So we have to pass in a list to the step function. So we have to uh, push this function up to our wrapper class. So we'll say actions is an empty list. Let's go ahead and, and enumerate agent choose action raw obs agent idx make sure you're passing in the correct observation for your choose action function and that is a bracket not a parenthesis that doesn't work and actions dot append action and then return your list okay now we need our function to learn and uh, we have to pass in the memory because the memory will be a global replay memory buffer that doesn't live in the MAD DPG class. Now you could put it here and then just have it be a, uh, a, a member variable of your MAD DPG class, but I just decided to keep it as a separate entity. So if our memory isn't ready, then return. So we don't want to re uh, we don't want to perform learning before we've filled up the 1,024 batch size. Uh, of our memories. Uh, so now we have to do a little bit of ugliness. Uh, remember that this is very similar to the deep deterministic policy gradients function for learning, uh, but we have an extra uh, loop here we have, where we have to calculate the values of the, uh, the actions according to the target actor network uh, for the new states, as well as the new actions according to the regular actor network for the current states. So there's uh, two different loops in here. It's a little bit ugly, but we're gonna get through it. So actor states, states, actions, rewards, um, actor new states, states underscore duns, memory.sample buffer. And then um, we're going to need a device because we have to send everything to a device. And this is a bit kludgy. You can certainly improve on my solution here uh, if you so choose because we have to put our tensors onto whatever CUDA device we have. So we say states equals T tensor. Device. Um, yeah, you could even move it up into the MAD DPG class if you wanted, but you know, there's a number of ways to optimize the code I've written, but whatever, it works. So t.tensor actions, t.float to device, rewards, it's also a uh, float, uh, eh, you don't actually even need that for the rewards. I take it back. And then we need states underscore. <laughs> uh, then we need duns. And now we need to uh, get actions for all agents. Say all agents new mu actions old agents actions equals empty list. So now we say for agent idx agent in enumerate self that agent. So we have to go agent by agent new states t dot tensor. We have to get the actor states. So actor new states agent idx for each agent make sure we pass it to the device we need our new uh, new actions so agent target actor new states what are the new actions what are this the actions for the new states according to the target actor all agents new actions dot append new pi 
and we say t.tensor t.float to device and we say Let me say all agents new mu actions dot append pi. And then we say old agents actions because we also need the actions the agent actually took dot append actions agent idx. So that's a whole bunch of stuff to keep track of. What we have here are the actions according to the target network for the new states the actions according to the actor network for the current states, and then the actions the agent actually took. We need all three of these for the calculations of our loss function. So it's a lot of stuff to keep track of, and we need it for each agent, so we have to use lists. So we'll say new actions is t.cat. We want to turn this into something more uh, suitable for inputting into our neural networks. So we're just going to concatenate along the first dimension. T dot cat uh, x for x in all agents new mu actions to m equals one, and then old actions equals t dot cat. X for X in old agents actions. Dim equals one. Okay, so we are almost there. So now we need agent, uh, we need our second loop. This is where we're gonna handle the cost functions. So we'll say critic value equals agent target critic. Sorry, they should be critic value underscore. We use that as for the new states. Uh, target critic dot forward states underscore new actions dot flatten and we say critic value underscore duns all rows zeroth element and that is because the duns are an array of of um, three elements of false for each agent right and set everywhere that is true equal to 0, 0.0. .0. And critic value equals agent critic value. Sorry, agent dot critic dot forward states old actions dot flatten. Then we say our target or the Y from the paper equals rewards all rows for this particular agent plus agent dot gamma times critic value underscore critic loss. MSE loss means squared error between the target and the critic value. And we say agent.critic optimizer zero grad um, critic loss dot backward tain graph equals true. Uh, that's just the way PyTorch handles things since we're making multiple passes through the graph. We have to retain it. So we say agent.critic optimizer step and our actor loss agent critic forward states mu dot flat so that mu is the actions for the um, current states according to the um, regular actor network so uh, it is what is the value of the what actions should we take given the new values of our actor network as opposed to the actual actions we actually took uh, and that comes into play the actions we actually took come into play up here in the old actions part then we have actor loss equals min minus t dot mean actor loss Agent dot actor optimizer zero grad lost up backward. Tang graph is true and step the optimizer work parameters and of course update your network parameters. 
Now that is almost 300 lines of code. That is a huge amount for such a relatively small project, but we're not quite done. We're almost there. We do need one helper function and that is this. So we'll say observation list to state vector. And that takes in an observation as input. And we'll say state equals mp.array just empty numpy array for obs in observation state equals mp concatenate state and observation and return state so this will just take the um, each individual 8 10 and 10 element numpy array and turn it from a list of three numpy arrays into a single numpy array of 28 elements in length for this particular environment. So if name So we're going to start with the simple scenario which if you take a look at the documentation is just an agent trying to reach a goal landmark. It's very trivial. It's just for debug purposes to make sure we didn't make a mistake. So we want to make our environment we want to get our number of agents we want to get our actor dimensions as an empty list and say for i in range and agents actor dims dot append env observation space sub i dot shape sub zero so we want to go ahead and iterate over uh, each agent's actor dimensionality and get that for our uh, number of actor dims and then our critic dims is just going to be the sum of each individual's actor's dims. So you'll have 8, 10, and 10 for each actor, for all three actors, and then 28 for the critic. So then we need our number of actions, env action space 0.n. And here I've assumed they all have the same number of actions. Uh, this will break if we have an environment in which uh, agents have different numbers of actions. Let's go ahead and make our, our main a set of actors, actor dims, critic dims, and agents, and actions. So one. Uh, here I actually passed in a value of zero, zero, 005. Interesting. Let's just do zero, 001. I was playing around with some hyperparameter tuning. Equals scenario and checkpoint dir equals temp slash m-a-d-p-b-g slash I might regret that I'll have to do some make durs on this that'll probably break memory equals multi agent replay buffer three one two three a million And a batch size of 1,024. So we will need uh, some more variables here. We'll need a, call it print interval. So we don't want to print all 25,000 games. So every 500 games will print something to the terminal. End games, we'll let it go for 30,000. Uh, max steps. This is the fact that the environment doesn't terminate when it reaches a terminal state because there isn't one. So we have to set a set of max steps for ourselves. Total steps, zero. Score history. I don't think we actually need, no, we do need total steps. I take it back. Evaluate whether or not we want to evaluate the performance of our agent and a best score of zero. If we want to evaluate then, we want to load a checkpoint. For I in range and games, observation env reset, score equals zero, done equals false times the number of agents because it's a list of false. Uh, episode step equals zero, while not any, well that's how I decided to do it, okay. If evaluate env.render, Actions. Choose an action. 
MV step actions. Convert our observations to state vectors. If we have exceeded our number of steps, then done equals true times and agents. Do I need to move that? I don't know, that might need to be moved. So ob state actions underscore state underscore done. If total steps modulus 100 equals zero and not evaluate. So if we're evaluating the performance of our agent, we probably don't want to learn. We're going to learn by passing in our memory. Set the current state to the new state. Uh, go ahead and get our total score for all of the agents. Increment our total steps. And good grief. This is a long tutorial, people. Uh, increment our episode step. And then say score history. Dot append score. Uh, yeah, every previous 100 games, not evaluate if average score, greater than best score, save our checkpoint, best score equals average score, and if i modulus print interval equals zero and i greater than zero, print I average score format average score okay wow all right so that is 360 lines of code and I'm certain I've made numerous typos in here <gasps> whoa ha huh? <laughs> Be still my heart, I did not. Okay, now, no basic typos. Let's see what I messed up. Moment of truth. And in that function, that was right from the uh, get-go. So that's nn.function null. Uh, at least that one's easy. Device is not defined. What did I call it? Uh... down here device wait a minute am I not reading something correctly and that is line oh it should be self dot device line 125 yeah self dot device and then, uh, well, why didn't that? Oh, because I instantiate the actor first. Self dot device. There we go. Has no attribute actor dims. That is in line. Oh, okay, so that's in our replay buffer. Line 32, self dot, it's Craig Dems. Yeah, I apparently did not save that. Okay. Okay, let's try it again. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. It says found the type float, but expected double. That is in my critic loss. Interesting. 
found D-type float, but expect a double. Why would you expect a double? Hmm. Uh, that is in the critic loss. Line 282. So it expected a double. So that must mean that something in there is a double. I didn't turn everything to a float. So I wonder if the rewards are saved as a type float. Let's try that again. That one kind of puzzles me. Agent as attribute, no attribute loss, line 288. Um, that's because it's actor underscore loss dot backward. Uh, Timzer, yeah, that's not right, is it? Line 289. Uh, Tim's are okay. And now it should error out on the directories because I haven't made new directories. <laughs> uh, good grief. Yeah, this is a long video, folks. Must forgive me. Ah, so it is running, it is learning, it won't error out without the directories until uh, it hits a score of zero. And what I'm seeing here is that the score is going monotonically up, so minus 16, minus 11, minus 9.6, minus 9.1. Okay, it didn't go monotonically up, uh, but it is going up. Let us see. Now kind of flat lines around 9.9. .9. 8.6. If you recall from the paper, the learning curve was tend to flatten at around uh, 5,000 games or so. So that's kind of the behavior I'm expecting here. And oscillations don't worry me. You do get that type of stuff in actor critic methods. So I'm going to go ahead and terminate there. I'm going to double check with my cheat sheet code to make sure uh, that that score is reasonable. Give me one moment. Okay, so I have uh, double checked with my cheat sheet code and it gets pretty much the same thing. So let's do this. Let's do a make dir temp, make dir temp slash MADPG. Simple adversary. And let's go ahead and check out our main file here and change this to a simple adversary and now we are going to have moment of truth and let this run and I will be has no attribute target save ah of course line 196 yet another target uh, actor dot save checkpoint All right, this is a new one to me. That is interesting. I will have to take a look at that and get back to you in a moment. I have something else to do really quick. Okay, so I went ahead and took a look at the code and uh, the conclusion I've come to is that perhaps I've done something that has offended PyTorch version 1.8, which is what we are uh, using here. So we do a pip list, we get torch 1.8.1 and in my normal build I'm doing 1.4. The code is otherwise identical so I don't think I made a mistake. So what we'll do is pip uninstall torch and then do pip install torch equals 1.4.0. Alright, so let's try it again. So 
So it hasn't aired out yet. Is that a good sign? Looks like something is running here. Perfect. So there it goes. It's already executed 500 episodes with a negative score of 32.2. .2. So let's let this run for a little bit and see how it does. And of course, I encounter an error uh, as it's trying to save a checkpoint that is in line uh, 196. It should be a save underscore checkpoint. And the encouraging thing is you can see that this score is definitely trending up over time from negative 32.2 to negative 7.9. So it should get a score of about zero, you know, one or two points or so within 25 steps. So this is moving in the right direction. I'm gonna go ahead and um, fix that and see that's in line, what is that, 196? All right, let that run again, and then we will see how far we can get. Okay, so this has run almost 10,000 episodes, and it's done something I actually haven't seen before. It started out with a really large negative score for this environment, something like 150 points, and then shot up all the way to zero. Uh, so you can see now it is doing much better every 100 games. I think I put the indentation on this saving checkpoint stuff in too far. Uh, but you can see that the uh, average score of around 0 0.8 is about the best we can do for this environment. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop and take a look at that code. But that is to me a pretty obvious indicator of learning. Um, now that's within the best score equals average score. Oh, interesting. Okay, so yeah, so this is um, clear evidence of learning. So we have solved the multi-agent deep deterministic policy gradients problem, going from a terrible score of negative 149 all the way up to something like 0. Uh, 0 0.8 or 1 points. Now keep in mind we terminate the episode after 25 steps, so it's not going to get a really, really high score. Uh, if you allow it to run for more steps, it can achieve a higher score, but the end result is more or less the same where it exhibits the same type of behavior. So you're not really gaining anything by doing that. You're just getting a higher score on your screen. So I've already shown you the uh, video of the agent playing. Maybe if I, uh, maybe I'll go ahead and loop in some uh, some video of it of this particular one playing as well. Uh, obviously, at the beginning was from the old agent that I did on my cheat sheet. So this is totally solved. And again, the main point here is that it is it's deep deterministic policy gradients where we have allowed the critics access to the actions of all the agents as well as the observations of all the agents while keeping the actor networks totally uh, confined to their own observations and actions. So it's a relatively simple tweak to a uh, to a deep learning algorithm, deep reinforcement learning algorithm that results in uh, co both competitive and cooperative behavior. If this was helpful for you, if this was a paper you've tried to implement before but couldn't do it, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you can see me implement more papers in the future. Uh, leave a comment, a like, and I will see you in the next video.